Welcome to HurtTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is the May Garden Checklist video. We do one of these each month for things that we have going on in our garden here in Raleigh, North Carolina. I think the first year we did these, we went into way more detail, uh, you know, what anybody and everybody might do in their May Garden if you want to go back and look at that. But again, we mostly cover what we have going on and we have a lot of projects going on. And honestly, we're a little behind. Uh, I went out to uh, the West Coast for a trip and then Steph and I went down to uh, Atlanta and Athens, Georgia and Columbia, South Carolina and did some things. And we also got very sick uh, for a little while. And so we're a little behind. We, I, I've talked for the last two months about mulching out here that I was about to mulch and I still haven't, but it's coming Monday and it'll be mulched this next week. And so we're finally here and really hammering away uh, at getting the garden in good shape. With lots of shrubs, lots of perennials, lots of annuals. We started from seed, uh, tons and tons of things. I really, this time of year, you're gonna have the best selection of plants you're gonna have any other time of the year. And so all of your annuals, perennials, shrubs, trees, fruit plants, natives, non-natives, everything is gonna be far more available this time of year. And I really like to plant this time of year. And I like to plant all year round, as long as the ground is workable. Uh, frequently we hear fall is for planting a lot and I think people hold off sometimes all the way until fall to do things and they just may not get done. I definitely want to plant any marginal plants in the spring. So things that can get killed by staying too wet in the winter, grasses would be in that group. And any marginal plant that's barely hardy in your area, you'd like to get it in in the spring as early as possible, let it get rooted in and fill out during the growing season. When you're out shopping for plants, keep in mind if you go during the spring and you buy all shrubs that are in flower right in the early spring, you're going to end up with a garden that only blooms in the spring potentially. So I do encourage you to go back throughout the year and take a look, you know, right through fall. There's probably something in your area that blooms spring, early spring, mid to late spring, summer flowering and fall flowering things that can extend the time of year. And also just looking for color textures. Uh, you know, leaf textures, the, the size of the leaves, you know, looking at bloom times, looking at foliage color, using narrower, you know, grass-like plants next to larger leafed tropical looking plants, mixing all those things together really blends well out here in the garden. And so that's what we're looking for. And we're also looking for kind of layering the sizes of things where we've got larger things in the middle of this bed behind me and then some woody ornamental shrubs you know, down below those. We have a perennial border that wraps across here, and then we have an annual border that mixes here. So we have this you know, layering going up in the garden and then different foliage colors and different textures. You know, that's the kind of thing we're looking for when we're out shopping for plants. This time, it, you know, another, another thing you might wanna be on the lookout for are ground covers. We have a lot of ground covers out here in this garden and they reduce substantially the amount of mulch we're using. The very first year we started this project, three years ago, I ordered 18 yards of triple shredded hardwood mulch. Okay, 18 yards, that's what it took to go from front to back because this was just little plants stuck in the ground here and there all over the place. I think it was a little extra. I think 16 would have been the magic number that year. The second year I ordered 12, and this year it's down to seven and I hope that, and that may be even a little too much. So we've gotten now the gaps between everything getting smaller and smaller and smaller and the, and the ground covers filling in, that kind of thing. And so we're reducing the amount of money we're spending. So we're always out looking for interesting ground cover things. Tropical plants are definitely going to be readily available. You know, now uh, this Diplodenia we'll put in a container and most of the things we do, we'll do from seed uh, and we'll buy little four packs and, uh, and six packs of things. Here's a you know, four pack of begonias here. We're trying to do as inexpensive as possible, but I'll take something like this tropical plant and spend $7 on it and it's gonna get this big this season. And so I feel like I don't mind, you know, I don't mind spending a few extra dollars on it if it's going to get massive and it's gonna bloom nonstop all summer long. All the summer bulbs are available now. So if you're looking for caladiums or, uh, uh, dahlias, uh, what else would I, would, would be in that, would be in that group, bananas, um, uh, elephant ears, lots of things that are available. They're still available in the garden centers for those kinds of things to give you some of those tropical things. And some of you in colder areas can just dig those things up and store them for the winter. Those of you in the South, you know, they can just be, 
you know, in the ground permanently. The other thing that Steph and I are out looking for all the time are pollinator plants. Pollinators make up really the most part, the biggest part of the enjoyment of this garden for us is watching all the things that we've invited into this garden enjoy it. So this Plectranthus uh, is an example of that. Had a hummingbird on it uh, yesterday. Uh, this uh, Agapanthus, great example of that. It'll have hummingbirds on it during the uh, summertime. And we'll have, so we have things for hummingbirds, we have things for the native bees, we have things for, you know, that tend to be visited more by just honeybees. Uh, we have salvias and we have interesting natives and then non-native things that offer lots to uh, our native pollinators as well. That's one of the things that's important to us. That's how we enjoy the garden, is watching other things enjoy the garden. It's definitely time to be refreshing your containers. And what we look for when we're combining things into containers is we'll look for different foliage colors, different foliage types, different shapes. You know, so you got this sorrel that's kind of got this long lanceolate leaf on it. And it actually pairs quite nicely with this euonymus down below it. And they both look great with this boulevard cypress. That little combo of a, uh, you know, a thriller and a filler and a spiller uh, just, look, just look great together. You can walk around the garden center and compare all these pieces together and things you would never in a million years think would go together. Sometimes will. We do the sorrel from seed and it will definitely be the star of a lot of our containers. It's just so easy. Uh, you can do them from seed inexpensively and they have these interesting veined leaves in them. Of course, you can eat it if you choose to as well. This uh, container, you know, it's uh, got the variegated pittosporum in it, and which, you know, did, did great out here through the, uh, through the winter time. And then we've got the ground cover creeping jenny, you know, you know, coming over the edge of it. Occasionally we have to rescue the uh, pittosporum from the creeping jenny a bit, but it just, it looks great together. You got the different leaf type, slightly different shades. Um, another thing we like to do, we'll do a couple of monochromatic containers as well, where everything is the same color. Everything's purple or everything's yellow or everything's blue, whatever it is. Those are kind of fun as well. But walk around the garden center and just pick something up you like and then just walk around and find the other two things that kind of match with it like this. Here in Raleigh, our average last frost date is around April 15th. We're shooting this around the 27th, 28th of April, something like that. Uh, so we're a couple weeks past what is our, or a week and a half past what is our average last frost date. We've gotten freezes in right into the end of April and the beginning of May. So nothing is impossible, but we seem to have passed it looking out at the 10 day forecast. So we've gotten our tomatoes in the ground. We've gotten some of our peppers in the ground. We've planted a few of our seed. Uh, actually, I can see a cucumber has germinated uh, or, or come up from seed that I planted in a video a couple weeks ago. But our cool season vegetables are still out here. We started our cool season vegetables back in January in videos and they, they're in the ground out here. They're doing great. Of course, they just thrive in these cool nights in April and May. As the nights get hotter, uh, they, they get kind of worn out. So we'll keep harvesting them as much as we possibly can. We've planted our taller growing summer vegetables out here. So hopefully they're gonna come up and shade them a bit and maybe extend the period of time uh, that we can harvest, maybe not. You can go ahead and pull them out once they start to decline, or most of these things, these lettuces, uh, most of our uh, you know, kale, broccoli, cauliflower, all of those cool season things, most of them will come to seed and we can actually collect the seed on them. So these are, this is kale that was left in the garden with intent. Uh, you know, it's gotten bigger than we wanna eat. It's probably quite bitter if we wanted to eat it at this point, but it is flowering. The pollinators go crazy for it and then we'll set some seed on them we'll collect the seed and that way we don't have to uh, we don't even have to buy the seed uh, go, going into the future so it's definitely time again to be putting all your summer vegetables in the ground if you're in an area that has passed your average last frost date you might want to, if you're in zone five it might be well into may i don't i don't know you know what your average last frost date is but you want to wait for that and you don't gain a whole lot by planting them before that the Peppers like the soil temperature to be around 65 degrees. So if you're having nights in the low 40s, and you, so you're not getting frost and you're not getting freezes, but the nights are in the 40s, uh, the, the soil temperature is gonna be below 65 and they're not gonna be happy anyway. These are true tropical plants, these summer vegetables that we love so much. And they really do like the soil warm and the air warm. So keep that in mind. 
we leave some gaps in the garden so that we can stagger plant a few things. So we'll start a few more peppers and a few more tomatoes a little later in the season. And it, te it tends to, those plants tend to extend us well further into the fall than the ones we're planting this early in the season. We're doing lots. We, this area is all, this area is our only really truly full sun space in the summertime. The sun just tr literally tracks right over this space right here, a little to the north, and it just gets blasted with sun. I've said this many times, I'd rather have my vegetables just kind of integrated into the garden, the whole garden. I'd let my tomatoes climb on a tree. I wouldn't, it wouldn't, it wouldn't that's the way I would like to do it. Unfortunately, between the rabbits and this being our only sun area, they're all kind of congregated here together. It's also the congregation area for our strawberries, oregano, sorrel, all of our, you know, mint in a container, uh, more sorrel. There's some beautiful fennel uh, right there. And we our potatoes are around the corner over there. So pretty much all of our edible plants are here together in one space. Rosemary is included in that. So, you know, look for all of those things too. There, It's nice to be able to walk out your door and get your mint and get your, uh, get your sage. Uh, all these things are pretty easy to grow, honestly. Uh, and, and a lot of them are perennial. The sorrel is perennial. The mint is perennial. The fennel, you know, comes back reliably every year. Oregano, thyme. A lot of these things, you plant them once and you're done. We'll add, we add parsley and a few, a few seasonal things to the space, but all the edible plants here is the time of the year they go in the ground. We have mulch coming on Monday and there's a definite order uh, to things that I, I like to follow so that I'm not in the beds a whole lot after I mulch. You know, the less foot traffic you have in them, the better, you know, that breaks that barrier, you know, and allows weed seeds to come up. Of course, can't stop the squirrels from burying half the neighborhood out here and bringing weed seeds up to the top, but that, that's life. The first thing is weeding. And, you know, we've waited a little while to mulch here this year. And so some of the summer weeds are probably germinating at this point. We've, you know, our winter weeds are winding down the hen bit, that kind of thing. And the summer, you know, you may, crabgrass and things have already germinated here. so. That's in the process of happening. Luckily for us, we left our leaves down here through the winter, and so we really haven't gotten any seasonal annual weeds germinating at all. What we do have, though, unfortunately, is a lot of maples, a lot of invasive things like uh, English ivy that seeds itself in here. We have a few other vining things, unfortunately, like um, autumn clematis that seeds itself in here, porcelain berry that seeds itself in here, and uh, those things come up regardless of any mulch barrier. You know, the birds are dropping them and, uh, and or they're falling off a tree or whatever. So, you know, as we were limbing this Shasta viburnum up in a video that you guys will see next week, uh, underneath it there's just, um, you know, all kinds of weeds that we need to get out of there before we mulch uh, under this tree. Pruning would be the second thing after weeding. So I want to get any major pruning that I want to do done before I mulch the beds. Again, trying to stay out of them. The things we'll be pruning at this point were the super early flowering uh, spring shrubs. So things like azaleas as they're finishing up, you can, you can prune those. Uh, any, of the, uh, any of the shrubs that have bloomed already, okay? Those are, the, those are the things that are eligible for pruning at this point. You can still do rejuvenative pruning. So if there's a plant that's just gotten out of control and you really just, it's, it's just too much that you can still cut those things down at this point. You can still prune boxwoods and things that you don't, conifers, things that you're not relying on flowers, you can definitely, you can definitely prune. Your bulbs, you know, our bulbs have pretty much finished blooming. We don't wanna cut those back yet. This thing is in the, pro these are in the process of rebuilding the bulb from the energy that they used this year to flower. So we can deadhead them. I can take the flower stalk down and cut that off, and but I leave up the rest of the bulb. They'll die back in the next few weeks. It is what it is. There's a week or two, three weeks where they're not the most attractive thing in the garden, but they need this time to rebuild that bulb for next year. The other things we might prune are some of the uh, perennials that bloom all summer. So if we had a salvia that bloomed all summer long and it's just coming up with just a couple, you know, you know, barely any new growth on it, three, four pieces coming up, we might cut that thing, you know, 20% off the top of it and that'll branch it and fill it out more. As we're putting annuals in the bed, I'll come around here 
and show you. We will, you know, we'll pinch the flowers. If this ageratum had flowers on it, I would pinch them. I can pinch the, I can pinch the flower, you know, just like this out of this celosia, and that will cause some branching down here at the bottom and fill this thing out. Otherwise, it might just try to keep growing tall and skinny. I want it to fill out and be bushy. It's going to bloom all summer. It's going to have this beautiful purple foliage all summer. So I don't mind slowing it down a bit because later in the summer, it'll be much fuller because of it. If you have any fall blooming perennials, let's say fall blooming asters, fall blooming mums, or fall blooming sedum, like autumn joy sedum or something like that, during the month of May, those things will grow quite a bit. You can actually take about 20, 30% off the top of them at some time toward late May, and that will thicken them up and they'll be much, much showier uh, come fall. Fertilizer wise, we fertilized almost two months ago at this point, maybe a little more than that. And I use an organic fertilizer out here Everything here is done organically. Uh, if something is chewing on something, then yay, my, my garden is part of nature. And that's life. Well, if it's got a spot on a leaf, we don't worry about it. This garden is part of the natural world and things are gonna have spots, things are gonna have holes. I don't, I don't mind it. And then we use organic fertilizer because we're trying to build the soil. The soil, we are not necessary <laughs> for these plants to thrive. Okay, what we need to do is build the soil and the soil is what's necessary. All the nutrients in the soil, all the soil life, all the uh, mycorrhizal fungi, the beneficial bacteria, those are the things we need to build. And so we build those by using compost, by keeping the ground cover with some sort, ground covered with some sort of mulch, whether that be wood chips or hardwood mulch or pine straw or whatever the heck you wanna use uh, to keep the ground covered and keep it cool and protected and keep moisture in the soil and keep, you know, that this is the thing that builds the soil. And then we use a small amount of organic fertilizer to help that system along a bit. At this point, about three years into this project, we probably don't even need that. Our annual things, our color things in our vegetable garden, we will, pro we will come back sometime, maybe toward the end of May, maybe mid-June uh, and fertilize those things again. And so, the things that we're trying asking a little more of during the season, we'll add a little extra fertilizer to. Otherwise, the shrubs, trees, the, even our perennials, they're on their own. They'll be fine because we have protected the soil life. When we dig out here now, if I, we're, we're cutting a worm in half, which there's no way we're not. We can't dig a hole out here now. That there, there's not a handful of life coming out of the soil and it's easier to dig out here and so, this whole process that we followed of feeding the soil and letting the soil feed the plants has worked out beautifully. I think I covered the benefits of mulch just then, but just in case I didn't, uh, we are about to mulch and that should help us suppress some weeds this summer. You're gonna have to weed in your garden. There's no magic pill for that. You know, even you know, people trying to use landscape fabrics and boxes and any other thing you're trying to use, you are at some point going to have weeds in your garden that you're going to have to deal with. What we're trying to do is minimize that as much as possible. And so we'll put a, small, a thin layer of mulch a couple times a year uh, now and again in the fall when those winter weeds are trying to germinate around October, sometime, sometime right in there. And what we, we do, weed the place first. Like I said, as the first thing on maintenance here, weed it first, then mulch. Water-wise, Interestingly, April's statistically like our driest month of the year. April and May are actually historically pretty dry here. Uh, we've gotten lots of rain though over the last month, so I don't have to think about it a whole lot. But as you're putting these things, these new plants into the ground, keep in mind that you are responsible for them for a little while until they get roots on them and are able to push roots out into the surrounding soil. But be careful not to overwater. I have seen in the 35 years I've been doing this, way more plants love to death than underwatered, okay? So, you know, go out and check them. I, I'll, I'll come out and, and, and pull back a plant and stick my finger down in the ground an inch or two near the base of it and see if it needs water before you start watering. When you water, drown the space around it. Water it very thoroughly and then walk away and, and take some time away from it and then come back again and check it again in the future. While you're checking underneath it, you'll probably find weeds like I just did. If you're going to do any kind of drip irrigation installation, this would be the time of year to do it, you know, while you're getting the plants in the ground and before you mulch and that kind of thing, before you're, uh, you know, while you're in the, in the prep and plan mode, that would be the time of year to be installing that kind of thing.
You planted some bulbs in the fall and now they've bloomed and they're gonna die back to the ground soon and then you're not gonna remember where they are. So I encourage you to map out your garden. Uh, where, did, where, are the, where are these bulbs before they go to sleep? Because they're gonna spend six, you're, it's, it's gonna be as much as eight months before you see them breaking the ground again and you, you have the possibility of digging, forgetting where they are and then digging them up. We map out, journal and map, everything in this garden and so we know what's missing. Our perennial border here in the front garden is definitely missing a few perennials. And so we're giving it more time. We're still waiting and I'll wait, you know, I'll wait a while longer, but I know that that December freeze definitely killed a few things. Not a lot, but a few things are missing. And again, we know what they are because we had written them down. Definitely encourage every every one of these videos encourage you to go to public gardens in your area take a look at what's blooming at different seasons take a look at combos that are done by you know people that do this every day uh, they probably have some interesting combinations of things also because of that december freeze you're going to be able to go into a public garden right now and find out what really withstood it in your area you're going to see the things that got damaged just like maybe the things did in your garden but you're also going to think, see the things that just held up incredibly well to it and that that may be helpful uh, use a plant ID app, get a good plant ID app. I like PlantNet uh, is the one, one that I use on my phone. If I'm walking past something somewhere and I don't recognize it, you know, you can take a photo of it and use that to identify it. It works most of the time, not all the time, but, but it, is, it is helpful to have, especially if you're learning, you know, as a new gardener and you're walking around your neighborhood and you see something that, that's interesting. A little self-promotion. I have a Learn to Garden series over on my website, horttube.com. There's a $50 off coupon uh, below this video, link below this video. It's a great Mother's Day gift. <laughs> There's about, I don't know how many videos are on it right now. There's actually another one going up in the next couple of days this weekend uh, on watering. It's just an entire video on how to water in the garden. And so the Learn to Garden series is just very long, you know, longer formed, videos of very specific things whether it's mulching weeding watering whatever it is pruning that kind of thing so that the things i'm covering in that learn to garden video series the pruning video the pruning video that's going to go up the first of the week uh, is not just on the early season shrubs it was also about uh, taking care of some of the bullies in the garden some of these perennials go to sleep in the winter and come back and they're super super aggressive so this salvia is going all into all these other plants and it's got to be rained back in or eliminated if it's too much of a bully we also put up a video uh, about uh, dividing hosta recently and this is a good time of year to be dividing perennials grasses any of those things as they're most of the things as they're emerging you might want to you might, you might want to ask the question on Google to make sure, but for the most part, most perennials that are coming up, you know, this salvia would be an example of that, hosta would be an example of that, daylilies. As they're coming up, you can pop them out of the ground, cut them in half, and, you know, split them into two, split them into two or more uh, if, if you want to. One thing that's important to us and important to this garden is birds. Birds are an important uh, component to taking care of a lot of our insect problems in the garden. And so we invite them in. This is a bird paradise back here. I don't know if you guys saw the bluebirds going in and out of the house over there while we were shooting the vegetable garden piece. We try to get out of there as fast as possible. I can actually hear them in the box right now. Uh, the little one, the, the, the fledglings are in the, in the box and man, those bluebirds work hard all day long over there. So excited about that, but they're, you know, they're out here. You know, some of them are eating insects, some of them are not. Um, you know, but uh, some of them are just eating berries and that kind of thing. We also have plants out here that are planned specifically for birds. And so this viburnum nudum is an example. This is a native viburnum. It's about to, the flowers are about to open and the pollinators will come in and, and take care of m turning these into berries, which the birds will then take in the fall. So there's a lot of thought put into that as well as, you know, not just butterflies and bees and hummingbirds but also birds birds being important important part of it and i think you can hear it in the background of these videos you know this that that's another thing that's very inviting about this space and we're in an urban space here in raleigh north carolina and you know there's trains passing by and cars passing by these birds help drown that out just a little bit uh, one thing i'll point out like on this viburnum nudum 
we have there's a, another channel called Garden Plants with Jim Putnam, and it's basically just like Steph just described it, an encyclopedia of plants. It's just, we're putting up individual plant videos with descriptions on them. This Viburnum nudum is one of them that's going up on there in the next few days. So thank you guys for following along with the channel. Uh, we've been behind. Uh, are you behind on anything in your garden right now? Uh, because we are, and we're, we're finally gonna rectify that, I think the first of the week and get uh, moving forward on all these things that are you guys saw on the lawn earlier and then uh, also the getting these leaves covered up back here and neatening up the entire space. Thanks for watching.